Hello and welcome to the next in our series of webinars on the Sisters Qualifying Examination or the SQE. I hope you're all doing okay in lockdown. My life outside work seems to be an endless series of trips to cold muddy parks. But with spring coming, I'm optimistic that I'm going to look forward now to an endless series of trips to warmer muddy parks. Now, today's session is about qualifying work experience. Now, to avoid us saying the phrase qualifying work experience and an annoying amount of times, um, we may use the shorthand QWE throughout this webinar. And today's session is going to be covering QWE from the law firm's perspective or an employer's perspective. Now, I'd like to flag if you haven't been to one of these sessions before, it'd be worth you having a look on our YouTube channel because we actually do have a number of webinars about qualifying work experience. We're also due to do one from a candidate perspective in the next month. And also I'd flag up, it's very much worth visiting sra.org.uk forward slash SQE um, for resources on qualifying work experience. There's some useful visuals as well as guidance on what we expect around qualifying work experience. Today we're going to be um, focusing on four key themes. Firstly, what is qualifying work experience? Secondly, what it means for training contracts um, and opportunities for firms. Thirdly, confirming qualifying work experience who decides what counts as QWE. And then fourthly, um, the issue of sort of quality and some practical tips. Now, we've already had quite a lot of questions um, come in. Um, we're going to be incorporating those throughout this webinar. Um, if you saw our recent common questions webinar, that's the one where Richard and I embarrassingly wore the same outfit. Um, uh, we've coordinated not to coordinate today. Um, we'll be covering quite a lot of similar ground and that's very much in response to we're getting similar themes and similar questions uh, coming in. But we do also have the option for live questions. You can submit them by clicking on the link below, put your question through and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. I can confidently say you can ask whatever you want because I'll be asking the questions rather than answering them. And that's why I'm joined by my colleague, Richard Williams, um, who's led on developing the resources and guidance in this area. And he's going to be answering those questions and doing most of the talking in this session. Before we get sort of stuck into the detail, let's firstly remind ourselves what the solicitor's qualifying exam is and how qualifying work experience fits into that. So. The SQE is the new way of qualifying that it comes into effect um, in September this year. Qualifying work experience, as you can see from the jigsaw there on the screen, makes up one of the four pieces of the puzzle, so to speak. So the other three pieces are you need a degree or equivalent. An equivalent is something like an apprenticeship. Secondly, you need to pass the SQE 1 and 2 um, assessments, SQE 1 tests practical uh, legal knowledge and SQE 2 tests a combination of practical legal knowledge and practical legal skills. And also you need to meet our character and suitability requirements. So without all those four pieces, you can't qualify. So let's move on to qualifying work experience. So Richard, can you quickly remind people what is QWE? Thanks, Ben. Um in terms of what qualifying work experience is, any individual wishing to be admitted as a solicitor once the SQE is introduced will need to complete a period of qualifying work experience. So QWE is any experience of providing legal services which enables an individual to develop some or all of the competencies outlined in our statement of solicitor competence. Um, I know that we've had a, a quite a number of questions sort of pre-submitted about whether particular job titles or location of where qualifying work experience um, is obtained can count as qualifying work experience. So just to clarify those, qualifying work experience can be obtained, obtained here or abroad in any role or title. It can be paid or unpaid so long as that experience involves providing legal services um, and develops the individual um, exposure to some or all of the competences. And how long is the period of qualifying work experience? 
it must be a total of two years working full time or the equivalent on a part time basis. Now, we're not going to prescribe what part time equivalent is. Uh, we know that many firms have their own approaches and their own calculations as to what constitutes uh, part time. So they're much better placed to make that decision than we are. Um, in terms of kind of length, uh, qualifying work experience can be obtained in up to four separate organizations providing legal services. So there is no minimum or maximum prescribed length for each of those those placements. And um, we've had one of our uh, one of the first questions we've had come in is from Lauren and she's asked whether QWE can predate um, taking SQE1. And we've had a similar question from Adana as well. Uh, the answer to that is is yes, yes it can, uh, but we don't think that will be typical. We think that most candidates uh, will will do their qualifying work experience before uh, between taking SQE one and SQE two, but there's nothing to stop it being done beforehand. Um, I think the key point here, and it goes back to to the jigsaw slide, really, is that you know qualifying work experience needs to be completed uh, before qualification. Um, the most likely scenario for, might, be, might be someone like a paralegal who has already had years of experience wanting to claim qualifying work experience before they do their first exam. So um, qualifying work experience can involve any experience of providing legal um, services that gives an individual exposure to the competencies. But is there anything that actually isn't unlikely to, or is unlikely, sorry, to be qualifying work experience? So we're not going to prescribe what constitutes qualifying work experience um, as long as you know it meets our criteria and those criteria are that there is an opportunity for exposure to some or all of the competences. It meets the time criteria that I've we've just talked about and as long as it can be signed off by a solicitor or a compliance officer for legal practice and we'll come on to that um, later um, th then it is more than likely to count as qualifying work experience however I think there are probably a couple of circumstances where someone's experience is unlikely to count as qualifying work experience um, the first one of those is that exposure to a an ongoing, single, repetitive and very limited task for the duration of someone's placement is unlikely to be qualifying work experience. So, for example, you know, proofreading for 24 months is unlikely to give an individual um, exposure to some or all of the competences in our statement of solicitor competence. And then I suppose the second scenario where um, it may not count is that of um, st simulated legal services. You know, we, we've been quite clear that qualifying work experience is about being involved in real life solicitors work. You know, it's designed to give candidates experience to kind of those real life challenges and issues, the ethical situations that solicitors might well find themselves in. So on that basis, we've said that, you know, simulated legal services are is unlikely to count as qualifying work experience. So thanks, Richard. And we've had another question come in and it's from someone. If someone works outside an organisation that isn't gaining sort of experience in a traditional law firm setting, you know, with solicitors and clients, is it still possible to gain qualifying work experience by the looks of it in this setting? For instance, it's a not for profit organisation. Um, absolutely. The key the key point to really kind of uh, for, for people to to understand is that you know you can obtain your qualifying work experience in any any org you know any organization um providing legal services so long as you know you're getting exposure to some or all of the competences so you know um getting uh, ex exposure in house is valid getting in a traditional law firm is equally valid or in the kind of not-for-profit sector, law clinics, or even a non-regulated business. There, that's all okay, so long as you're meeting our criteria for qualifying work experience. So we've had another question come in, it's someone who wants to clarify whether if they only have experience of some of the competencies, is that enough, or do they have to go off and try and fill the gaps where they haven't had exposure to some competencies? I mean, the, the, the simple answer to that, that to that, Ben, is, is yes. Um, 
I suppose, you know, in an ideal world, the more exposure to the more competencies you have, you know, the better chance you may well have of, of understanding what is going to be assessed in the SQE2, but, but it's not essential. Some people may well uh, t take a particular placement that gives them exposure to some some of the competencies and then try and seek them out elsewhere or, or do some additional training. But, you know, the simple answer is, is, is yes. So, and just uh, probably the way I asked the question, I want to avoid any confusion there, actually. When we say yes is, that's answering, you don't need to have a role which gets exposure to all the competencies all at once. As long as you have a role that exposes you to some of the competencies, that counts as qualifying work experience. And I think the, the point we're making is that you, um, you, you'll you need to think about that, that ideally you want to get exposure to as many, if not all of the competencies, because that's going to help you when it comes to taking the SQE assessments. Now, uh, probably on a point, and we're going to talk about this later, but we've had a question just come in from Andrew, um, and I think it's relevant. He's asked, what is the position of the SRA if after providing qualifying work experience, a trainee or firm has serious concerns about the trainee's capabilities? And we'll come on to that um, sort of a bit on theme number three when we talk about confirming. But I think the key point there, Richard, isn't it? Firms aren't signing off whether, for want of a better term, someone is going to make a great solicitor or even whether they think they're competent. Absolutely. One of you know, the, the fundamental points, you know, in terms of sign off is that, you know, a solicitor, a solicitor or compliance officer for legal practice is just simply confirming the details of the placement, whether there was exposure to some or all of the competencies and whether there are any particular um character suits, suit, suitability issues. They are not making an assessment of, of competence. In the scenario that you, you've given there, you know, if someone's got a particular issue with, with someone's capabilities, we'd expect that to be picked up, you know, with ongoing conversations between the firm and the individual as part of a firm's wider um, obligation, regulatory obligation to effectively supervise members their employees essentially to make sure that they're competent to carry out the role they keep the professional knowledge and skills up to date and as well as they've got all the the right legal ethical and regulatory understanding so you know that that's an issue for for the firm and the individual um to be dealt with through their kind of existing supervision uh, and i suppose the, the point to add to that is that that's why the sqe is there that if somebody um, if there's serious questions about their competence, then that's what SQE 1 and SQE 2 is there to pick up. And in particular, if somebody hasn't got the practical legal skills or knowledge, there's a very rigorous assessment, um, um, in particular SQE 2, where um, there's a range of written and oral tasks that you're going to struggle probably to pass that if you have, um, so, you know, uh, there are issues related to competence. Only people who are good enough are going to pass that assessment. So I've got one final question before we move on to our second theme. Are there any other things that firms need to think about before um, before we go on to some more of the detail? Anything else you've missed, Richard? Um, I, I think it's just to perhaps reiterate that point around a, a firm's wider and existing regulatory obligations in the code of conduct just to make sure that you know they have that all their employees are competent to carry out their role uh, and to keep their professional knowledge and up to date and to effectively supervise because you know th that that essentially sort of you know predates qualifying work experience but equally you know it needs to be taken into account if you have individuals working for you who may want to claim qualifying work experience as well. You know, we very much expect those those obligations to be upheld. That's great. So let's move on to our second theme, and that is in particular focusing on the training contracts and some of the opportunities for firms. So let's pick up the training contract point. We've had a question from Jenny. She's asked, does the training contract no longer exist in the new system? It's a really good question and, we, and we're getting that question an awful lot. So this is a really good opportunity for us to clarify um, some, some of our thinking. So the introduction of qualifying work experience replaces the training contract as a regulatory requirement for admission once the SQE is introduced. Um, we think this is advantageous for individu individuals. It should mean that the training 
contract bottleneck we all we all know, know about and which is associated with kind of barriers to current qualification um is removed because there's a lot greater flexibility as to where individuals can get their experience and for a wider range of organizations to offer opportunities for individuals to get that experience and we mentioned some at the very beginning of this webinar um from a firm perspective we expect the firms will, will adopt a variety of approaches to how they approach QWE in light of that requirement being removed. Um, some will continue to offer a training contract once the SQE is introduced, while others will reconsider their position and come up with alternative approaches. Um, but I think you know the, the, the final point is that it's not a requirement or a regulatory requirement for a firm to offer a training contract. And it's not a regulatory requirement for an individual to get a training contract in order to, to qualify and be admitted as a solicitor. So that, that's clear. So there is a period of time during which people can still qualify through the, um, the old LPC route. Um, do they still need a training contract or what? Um, is often referred to as the period of recognised training. If an individual wants to qualify through the old kind of LPC route, as, as we know, and not take any of the SQE assessments, yes, you will still need a, a period of recognised training or what's known as, as the, the training contracts. So um, if anyone isn't sure um, whether a, a candidate or an individual can still do the LPC route, I think the starting point for both an individual and a firm who may well have you know, employees working from in this particular situation is, is to go and look at our transitional arrangements. You know, um, there's a lot of detail there um, and, it, and it will, will really explain what situations apply in which particular circumstances. We've also got previous webinars on, on that. So, you know, I encourage people to to go in and have a look at those but I, you know kind of at the most basic level if someone has started on their training journey by september this year that they have a choice to qualify qualify through the lpc or the sqe and um, so you mentioned that qualifying work experience that there's opportunities there for individuals with the greater flexibility but what are some of the opportunities or potential benefits for firms that they might want to consider okay there's less prescription with qualifying work experience as there is with the current period of recognised uh, training. So I think that that means that there's more benefits for firms to be to, to be obtained. So, for example, there's much greater flexibility now for firms to to think about and really tailor their approaches to training and development of employees in line with their business objectives and their business model than, than previously. So, for instance, now, you know, you don't have to rotate seats. You, know, you can focus on the areas of law which are relevant to, to your business. It's also an opportunity to, for firms to think about their approach to how they attract potential future you know kind of employees you know do they want a different type of individual do they want to try and attract a high caliber a higher caliber individual and if so what role does qualifying work experience play in doing that can they use their qualifying work experience provision as a, a unique selling point for their firm in order to try and recruit the, the the best talent so there's lots to think about in you know for a firm in terms of how they sell their you know their business as, as a place to come and work and I think you know there's also opportunities for firms that perhaps haven't to, haven't traditionally taken on trainees in the past you know they might want to think about whether this increased flexibility changes their position and whether or not they want to offer any any opportunities going forward in, in line with their business objectives. Now, that's really helpful. And we've had a question come in from Helen um, linked to this. Um, under the current approach, um, an individual doing a training contract is called a trainee. Um, what can a firm call someone who's carrying out qualifying work experience? OK, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, um, you know, there is no formal regulatory requirement for, for a training contract at the moment. And so there is sort of no formal regulatory uh, a, a title for an individual who's undertaking qualifying work experience you know it's not possible for us 
to come up with a single title for any particular role, given that there is much more uh, diversity and flexibility in where individuals can obtain their qualifying work experience. I mean, you know, one a single title would be very difficult to, to cover that multitude of, of potential scenarios. So what someone is called when they're completing their qualifying work experience is more than likely going to reflect what's in their employment contract or role title rather than us as a regulator prescribe a particular title. So, you know, a firm can continue to call a trainee solicitor, a trainee solicitor if they want, or they can come up with another title. Um, I suppose, you know, the kind of final point an important point on this is that you know you can't refer to an individual as a solicitor until that individual has been admitted okay and we've got a, a question that's sort of on the flip side of that is uh, what about when someone progresses through an organization and then they qualify um, for example someone who's worked as a paralegal do they then have to be called a solicitor Okay. I, again, we, this is a really sort of common question, so it's a good opportunity to, to clarify our position. So if, if an individual is admitted as a solicitor, they can still be employed by a firm, as in this situation, a, a paralegal. They will, however, need to have a practicing certificate. You know, the title of, of their role, again, is a matter for a firm. You know, we are unlikely to, to interfere or get involved unless, you know, perhaps their title may is misleading to, to clients. You know, I, I think, you know, the, the advice perhaps for firms is that as with the current approach to qualification is for them to have ongoing conversations with their um, with, with their trainees during that kind of period of qualification about the potential roles and opportunities that might be available under admission, you know, you know, and an individual and a firm might well agree to, to perhaps hold off submitting an application for qualification till a specified date. That would be fine. That's a matter for that individual and that organisation. But once submitted, you know, they will become a solicitor, although, you know, as we've discussed, they could be their title you know, could well not be solicitor. Now, um, some firms may be listening to this and thinking, well, it's sort of interesting, but ultimately this isn't relevant to me. I'm not planning on taking on new staff, you know, might be perfectly understandable in the current in environment. They might not be looking to train people up. But actually this change, even for someone in that position, does have the potential to be immediately relevant to firms and solicitors, doesn't it? There, everyone needs to be aware of this change. Absolutely. Um, uh, absolutely. I mean, even if you, you're, you're, for whatever reason, not thinking about the opportunities that, you know, qualifying work experience may well bring to, to, to your business, you will still need to be aware and understand about qualifying work experience. Because I think the, the, key, the key point is that you may well be approached by a previous employee or a previous trainee who has undertaken some experience at your organisation and is now looking for that period or that placement to be confirmed so you need to think about well how are you going to manage that process you know who's going to be involved who's going to be involved what's it going to look like if indeed someone does um does come to you and say please can you confirm this qualifying work experience you might also want to think about you know what are you going to say to new non-solicitor members of staff about how you're going, how your approach to qualifying work experiences and wider SQE training? Um, but I think the fundamental point is that, you know, you're, it's good to, to be able to have answers to these questions and have good, open, ongoing conversations with existing staff or those that might approach you about how you will, you know, how we, your process and your approach to these questions that's great, Richard. And I'm looking at the questions coming in and thank you for those who are sending them. And there's a number I think we'll be able to pick up as we go through and the various themes. But one that has just come in um, has asked to make sure all competencies are met. Can a person train longer than two years? Is there flexibility around that? Um, absolutely. You know, you know, all we're saying is that qualifying work experience from our, from, from a from our perspective in terms of a regulatory requirement needs to be a minimum of two years yeah so you could you could decide and if your firm yeah. decided actually yeah we want to do three years before qualification yeah. you'd have that conversation up front with the trainee or the paralegal or whoever the person relevant person is and take it from there so let's move on to our third big theme and this is one we get lots of queries about and this is 
confirming QWE, QWE and deciding who decides what is QWE. So on that question, Richard, who determines what is a qualifying work experience placement? Is it for a firm to say they're offering QWE or actually is it more about an individual claiming QWE? OK, and you're totally right, Ben. But, you know, we, we get an awful lot of sort of questions around this. And I think that really the most important consideration here is not whether qualifying work experiences are offered, but whether the work an individual has carried out has exposed them to some or all of the competencies and that they can demonstrate this. So in practice, we think most non-qualified lawyers and firms will have at least some exposure to certain tasks and experience as part of their role or wider career progression that will give them the opportunity to have exposure to, to, to some or all of the competencies. So if an individual can demonstrate this and can evidence it, then you know they are in a very strong position in order to be able to claim that for the purposes of, of, of becoming a solicitor, irrespective of whether or not it's been officially offered, their placement has been officially offered um, as a qualifying work experience placement or not. You know. That being said, you know, it's not for us as the SRA to determine whether placement meets our criteria. You know, we're clear on what that criteria is. Um, but I think other than that, what you know, it's really important that individuals and firms have conversations from the outset about what is you know, about expectations as to what the role may well provide in terms of qualifying work experience. And I think that in doing that, you know, a lot of, you know, you know, the potential um, kind of misunderstandings or, you know, will be avoided because there'll be a shared understanding that actually, yes, the period that I'm working with you, I'll get exposure to particular types of competencies and that will be qualifying work experience. And so this really is a shift in mindset, I suppose, and it's very much a deliberate change by the SRA. So whereas previously, whether a firm was going to offer a training contract was pretty much 100 percent in the gift of the firm and organisation, there's more, much more of a balance to this approach. There, there, there is, and you know, in, there is much, and there's more, I suppose, responsibility on an individual as well to make sure that they can evidence the work that they're doing, meeting some or all of the competencies. But you know, there's probably two reasons for the change. You know, we've already talked a little bit about the training co contract bottleneck and, and and that just means that lots of potentially competent people are unable to qualify because they simply can't get a, a training contract you know what they're left with is you know tens of thousands of pounds of debt from the lpc but but they can't they can't become a solicitor so you know that that's one what one reason for this change the other is is that by introducing the sqe you know we've got a very clear consistent robust check on the competence of anyone becoming a solicitor so you know we're moving away from the scenario where we've got 2000 plus firms assessing whether or not they think an individual is competent to to you know uh, to the sqe which is you know a single robust assessment of whether someone meets the standards we and the public expect so um i've just seen a question come in and it's sort of on it's sort of a point and a question but it's on that particular theme of competency somebody said oh well i'll read the question and then i'll have a go at answering it richard and then see what see what you think um so um, this person's saying you seem to suggest that qualifying work experience is not about competency if so why is it needed i think um i would say to that actually we're not saying at all that qualifying work experience isn't about competency what it isn't about though is testing competency and somebody make somebody signing off as you just mentioned, more than 2,000 firms all making their own judgment as to whether somebody has met the um, expected standard of competence. And that's the reason is the test of competence has si shifted onto SQE1 and SQE2. That's the check of whether someone 
is competent enough. But actually, I think when we consulted Richard on um, SQE and there were several years of consultation, I think there was strong feedback that people thought that element of work experience was important in people getting to develop the competencies, learn what it takes to be a solicitor, developing that sort of professionalism and ethics um, and getting exposure to the types of skills and knowledge that then is ultimately going to be tested through SQE 1 and in particular SQE 2. It, it, would that be fair, Richard, in terms of pick answering that question? No, I think that's that's a really accurate kind of uh, overview, Ben. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're right, you know, it, you know, the purpose of qualifying work experience is to give people that experience to what it is like, you know, what's likely to be involved as a, as a solicitor. Um, if from a firm's perspective, it's giving it's also giving them experience of what it's like to work in their organisation, isn't it, to, to some extent as well. But but ultimately, you know, that qualifying work experience, you know, will help people get exposure to those skills, competences, not you know, it, that will be assessed in SQE too. Yeah. Um, so just some more questions on the practicalities of um, confirming S um, QWE, sorry. Can a firm advertise a role saying, look, this isn't qualifying work experience? In terms of kind of advertising placements, I think firms will need to think quite carefully about this. I think our view is that placement should only be advertised as non QWE if a firm is 100% sure that there is no exposure to competences in the statement of solicitor competence you know like we've talked about before you know most roles will have at least some exposure so they'd have to think very much about whether or not you know there is no um, exposure at all but I suppose you know thinking about it perhaps from a firm's perspective you know there are advantages in offering um, placements as qualifying work experience. You know, it, it, you know, it, it's it's beneficial for an individual, but it's also kind of beneficial for for the firm to um, to try and attract and be exposed to a wider range or caliber of candidates. You know, it's really it it's. <laughs> It's a selling point for the firm, but it's also giving the individual an opportunity to be exposed to the competencies, gives them the best chance of passing the SQE. And obviously then, you know, the, the benefits of, of, of an individual being a solicitor working for that organisation. We've just had another question come in, Richard, and it very much picks upon the point you were just making, but I suppose it's worth hammering at home, seeing as there's a question come in about it. Um, this person's asked, when a paralegal or similar is recruited, can we at the outset refuse to allow the period of time to count as QWE? And I, th I think it's a very... It's very similar to the Gantz you've just covered is that you'd have to be 100% sure that that paralegal role wasn't going to have any exposure to the competencies to sort of make that make that call um, for somebody and to say you were going to refuse someone to allow to claim that as QWE. I think that's 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 absolutely right. You know, if an individual in in he may well be in that that, that particular um, situation can can say, well, look, the work that I've I've done or will be doing um, has enabled me to meet these competencies. Then you know, almost the default position of of um, the the firm needs to be well that it that, that is qualifying work experience, and they will need to to to, to sign it off. So let's just remind ourselves again who exactly can sign off qualifying work experience and, you know, what what are they confirming? OK, so in terms of the who, so uh, it, it needs to be confirmed by a solicitor or compliance officer for legal practice, a CULP, who we regulate. Um, this means that an individual who has evidence that they've met our QWE conditions um, could approach you. Or, or a COPE or another solicitor in your firm to, to confirm their, their qualifying work experience. I suppose in, in practice, it's likely to be the individual um, who has been involved in supervis supervising a particular a person that, that will, will be approached, but, but not always so. Um, it also means that it's not just a training principle, as under the current approach, you're signing off, off um, work experience. Um, and as we've mentioned, in terms of the practicalities, I think firms should start to really begin to think about what confirming qualifying work experience means for them as an organisation going forward. So I think that's a little bit about the who, I suppose the what. Um, for each placement or role, 
we're the following must be confirmed so you know we're asking um a solicitor or culp to confirm the time scale of the work experience so the kind of to and from dates essentially um that it provided an opportunity for that individual to develop some or all of the prescribed competencies for solicitors and again going back to that point about responsibility of the individual to say well look i've done these things these are the competencies i i've met here's here's my evidence um we're asking a or culp to confirm that there are no character and suitability issues um, that arose during the work experience uh, and that raises questions about whether candidates should be admitted as a solicitor and if there are we want to know what they are but i think it's really important for for those involved in confirming qualifying work experience that they understand that they're not making any judgment about the competence of an individual to to, to be a solicitor because as we've said that's the sqe that's the check but also that they're making no kind of judgment i suppose around the suitability of an individual to be a solicitor you know we have our character and suitability requirements and, and that enables us to pick up any issues and address any issues uh, around character and suitability that might well be raised through the, this confirmation of qualifying work experience so we've already covered the off the question of sort of can can you refuse to say a placement is qualifying work experience but if somebody uh, does that work can a solicitor or cult then refuse to confirm that qualifying work experience at the end of that process i mean we recognize that this is this is new for solicitors and it is you know a kind of a, sh a shift in approach as as we've discussed um so i, I think really as i've said b before the, the default position is that if a period of work experience meets our conditions and our criteria um then it is likely and highly likely that it will be qualifying work experience and you know the default position of someone signing it off is that actually it, it should be signed off so kind of in reality you know i don't think we expect there, that there'll be very few instances where qualifying work experience might well be refused i mean we, we touched on a couple at the very top of the webinar but i think it, it's it's really important for individuals who are signing off uh, or confirming sorry qualifying work experience um to think about their wider regulatory obligations so you know in confirming they will need to comply with with our principles and our code of conduct that they are acting honestly they're acting fairly at all times and they're not abusing their position by taking unfair advantage of, of an individual so i suppose in the world of qualifying work experience you know if someone is deliberately refusing to sign off qualifying work experience that you know meets our conditions then we're likely to want to have a look at that and want to look at whether there is a breach of our regulations okay we've had um quite a few questions so i think we can just fire the answer off to this quickly around can qualifying work experience be claimed retrospectively which i think the answer is yes you can claim it before um sort of the sqe comes in for for periods that you've worked before 2020 and also there's no time limit is there richard on when you can claim back to um but just to build on those questions that have come in the fact that qualifying work experience can be claimed retrospectively what what does that mean for firms what what how should they be sort of approaching that i mean in practice it, it means that a, a a previous employee or previous trainee might well approach them and say you know the work that i did for you for whether it's two years one year six months whatever you know i i want to claim that as qualifying work experience here's my evidence um here's what i did here's how it developed the competencies i, I, I want you to to confirm this now so you know what what if a, what a firm or an individual within a firm is really doing is 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 confirming those details that i i've mentioned and very much it's for a firm to to think about how how they do this but i think and we know you know most firms will have employee records etc so you know they firms might want to think about you know those records and keeping them in a way that enables them to deal with requests for qualifying work experience if, if a request is made to, to confirm it um i think the point there is a point here though ben that you know it may there may be some situations and some circumstances where actually 
for for kind of legitimate reasons an individual might um uh, approach a, a firm seeking retrospective qualifying work experience but uh, and a firm may not be able to con confirm it now if a firm can you know has legitimate reasons and they've taken appropriate steps to try and sign off but can't for example they have absolutely no record of that individual or there is no one around who can say well actually yes that that's that's the sort of work that this individual did then you know that they can't they can't sign they can't sign it off no that's great and actually you've we had a question from amy exactly on that point about uh, retrospective sign off and also um jade as well questions around sort of the how how do you prepare for um you know systems in terms of people appro approach approaching you we'll go on to talk about um sort of yeah the, the process it, it, in a bit because Chloe's also asked the question about that actually so when when is registration for qualifying work experience and when can candidates start claiming QWE so on the first point do you need to register to um, sign off somebody for qualifying work experience um, firms or organizations don't need to register to, to provide qualifying work experience so you know any you know as you've said any solicitor or cult um, can confirm qualifying work experience and we know about them because we have them in our in our systems because we obviously regulate them so in terms of an individual submitting information to claim qualifying work experience uh, we're going to open up the process for that in april april this year and we'll be providing more information on the kind of practicalities of, of how an individual does this shortly. And and somebody, somebody's asked, and although we'll be finding the details of that, they've asked about, will I need to, do I need to submit all my evidence from the, um, from the, 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 the template we've published? Richard, do you just want to tell people a little bit about the, the template and what the purpose of that? But that's not a regulatory requirement as such, is it? No, no, it's not a regulatory requirement that anyone who wants to claim qualifying work experience needs needs to complete. It's also not a reg regulatory requirement that firms need to have their systems aligned to that template. What what that template is really designed to do is to, is to give people, uh, I suppose, a steer on the type of details that they might want to think about capturing so they are in a really good position to be able to do two things. Firstly, to get that qualifying work experience confirmed by a solicitor or cult but secondly to be in a position where you know they've got the details easily and readily available at hand in order for them to complete our processes once they open in April. Now and I see that we had a question from Ellen about that but I think watch this space for news of tips on sort of a uh, how you go about that process but i think the headline is it's going to be quite quite straight straightforward so um yes but we'll provide more details of that so quick fire couple of questions one we've had asked is is it an individual signing off qwe or is it an organization it's the individual and a follow-up to that richard does the solicitor have to be um it's just come in currently practicing to be able to sign off qualifying work experience um they they just need to, to be on the to be on the roll in terms of being eligible to sign off so they don't you know they don't need to have a practicing certificate they just need to be on the roll i i just saw quickly that um our photo flashed up on the broadcast by the looks of it which was even more horrifying than seeing myself on camera so apologies to anyone who was um had to see see my my photo but uh, let's go on to our final um theme which is around sort of quality and practical tips and this is going back to that issue which we've already covered a bit that Qualifying work experience isn't about your signing off whether someone's going to be the best solicitor in the world or even whether you think they'd be a half decent one. But I suppose more broadly, that's it's not the case that the SRA is not interested in quality of qualifying work experience. I mean, I think, you know, it, it, it is it's a really important point. And I think, you know, we as we've said, as I said earlier, you know, firms already have an obligation on them in terms of our code of conduct for firms to to make sure that anyone they employ is is essentially competent um but also that, that they are effectively supervised so in a way quality to some degree is managed through that existing i suppose reg our existing kind of regulatory framework you know we would expect there to be 
you know effective supervision we expect you know people to to have uh to to, to be comp competent and firms will put in place processes to do that um but that that being said you know this is new it's different you know it's not it's not the tra training contract um and we want to understand how it's working we want to understand whether or not there's more we can do as a regulator to support firms and to support individuals um, in, in, in helping kind of understand qualifying work experience and, and making sure that it gets it's kind of gets embedded in the way that, you know, delivers the benefits that we've talked about today. So, you know, I think we're going to put in place uh, a number of, I suppose, kind of approaches just so we can get a, you know, kind of a, a sense and a temperature check of what's happening. So, you know, as with anything, any new policy that's introduced, we'll carry out an evaluation of qualifying work experience. So that'll be a standalone evaluation, as well as being part of the the overarching SQE evaluation. Uh, we'll, we'll put in place um, a, a helpline for individuals to contact us if they've got any particular issues with their with their placement and from a, i suppose from a firm's perspective we're going to put in place a community of interest for firms to share their experiences their their problems their issues and to try and highlight and kind of circulate best practice of qualifying work experience and all of those things um uh, the evaluation will be will probably be a year after the sqes come in into effect but the helpline and the community of interest will all be in place you know before sort of september september this year and as we mentioned there's lots and lots of material on our website some really kind of helpful uh, um helpful material so you know anyone interested in, in in knowing more about qualifying work experience you know i encourage them to take a look at that, those resources um so let's we've just got a few minutes we can do some um quick fire um questions question come in do you have to have completed qualifying work experience before being able to set sqe2 i think the short answer to that is no you can do uh, um qualifying work experience at any time but typically it would make sense to have done um a a significant amount if not all of your qualifying work experience before sqe2 because the types of skills that will be being tested and that are the types of skills you'd have expected to have gained through qualifying work experience um richard do you just want to share um some sort of what do you have any practical tips for firms on how they can meet our expectations around good quality qualifying work experience which in most cases or nearly all cases is going to be both in the interest of the the, the, the firm or organization employing the individual and the individual themselves uh, yeah ab absolutely uh, just before i get on to those tips i think it's just probably just worth pointing out you know we do expect firms to you know to to um to put in place kind of good systems and processes to ensure that there is you know good quality qualifying work experience you know that's covered as i've mentioned by the regulatory obligation but we also issued some guidance before before christmas that that that, that made th that point and um identified a number of ways in which the firms could do that so i'm going to pull out a few of those but i do think you know firms should really go and have a look at look at that guidance because if they do the sorts of things that 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 we, we we say um in terms of that guidance you know they're going to be in a really strong position of offering good quality qualifying work experience that delivers those those benefits you've mentioned but i suppose in terms of practical steps i think firms will need to to think about how they you know how they're going to make sure that individuals uh, get exposure to diverse and varied work that enables them to 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 kind of exposure to to some or all of the competencies you know that's not just beneficial from an sqe perspective it's also beneficial from a firm perspective because you're giving them an opportunity to to be exposed to how your business runs how your business works um I think it's really important that you know, firms should think about having discussions from the outset and an ongoing basis with individuals about expectations around a placement. You know, what 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 can an individual expect? What what is the firm? You know, in terms of supervision. You know, what what facilities are there for kind of providing feedback? How you know also checking that work and uh, you know is, is is okay how you know what what's the process around ensuring that an individual has the opportunity to to reflect on their work for example again that's that's you know there is a wider regulatory obligation on that i think an important point as well is is thinking about how how a firm can expose 
um, individuals experience role models, you know, and seeing how they behave ethically and in accordance with the code of conduct. And then I suppose, f finally, I think it's really around the sign off process and thinking about what a firm, you know, what is a firm's approach to being able to support individuals in terms of perhaps collating the evidence um, that they need in order to to confirm their qualifying work experience you know how can it be drawn down from hr systems Th those types of questions but also being clear with individuals who, who's going to confirm their, their, their qualifying work experience so thank you uh um thank you richard and on that point we've had one question come in um from lisa i think and this is around does it have to be one sort of solicitor or uh, she said supervisor who's signing off qualifying work experience or can it be different people signing off on different parts of somebody's qualifying work experience um it, you know that's very much for a firm to determine um but but there's nothing to say nothing to stop you know uh, there being one solicitor who signs off you know everybody's confirms everyone's qualifying work experience or if if within the same organization an individual has um spent six months in different departments that you know someone within that department signs it off so i think there's a there's lots of different ways in which firms can 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 really think about think about that based on what really works for them uh, and obviously if you're doing somebody might be doing qualifying work experience in a variety of organizations and most likely in that scenario you'd be having several different solicitors sign off i can't remember whether this is me having um, a brain freeze moment i can't remember whether we answered this but someone did ask does someone have to be currently practicing to sign off qualifying work experience and you don't have to be practicing that's right is it richard it's anyone on the role can that's so. correct yeah um so we've had a question from clive and Dilyana, but also there's a question from tom coming on a similar theme what should paralegals who've done the LPC do in light of these changes? Can they gain qualifying work experience? Um, absolutely. You know, the experience that someone's obtained as, as a paralegal, you know, is, is, is likely to, 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 to be, you know, you know, um, eligible for, for, for qualifying work ex experience. So, um, you know, the, someone who's, you know, if they've done the LPC as well, you know, they can get two years qualifying work experience and then take the SQE in order to, to, to qualify. So, you know, that's, a, you know, that, that's one of the advantages of qualifying work experience. You know, it really does open up um, the routes to, to, to admission for those who may well have struggled perhaps to get a training contract in the past. And just to clarify, and I think this is what Tom was asking about, if you've done the LPC um, and you've gained the qualifying work experience, you would then have to take SQE2 in order to um, qu qualify. As I say, that would really be a scenario for perhaps somebody who was struggling to get a training contract but had built up um, built up perhaps qualifying work experience. Well, perhaps we'll go to the final question because I know we're well over t time, but thank you everyone for putting those questions in. And Agnieszka has asked, what should firms outside the UK keep in mind of if they're offering the SQE route? What what should they be thinking about for their trainees? Um, I, I suppose there's a, there's a couple of points. The first one in, in relation to QWE, um, you know, as I said at the beginning, you know, as long as it's, it's providing legal services, it can be obtained here or abroad. So there are opportunities for firms with, with, with overseas offices for, 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 for their staff or for their employees to, to, to gain exposure in those contexts. Um, and that's absolutely fine, so long as it's signed off by a, a solicitor um, that we regulate. Um, so that, that's, that's one point. I think the other point is probably in terms of the assessments themselves, Ben. Um, you know, the SQE1 will be offered in a range of centres in the UK and abroad. So, you know, there's, there's lots of kind of overseas provision there. But I think it's worth being, you know, firms being aware that any candidate who wants to take the SQE2, which is, you know, as we've said, focuses on the practical skills and knowledge, you know, they would need to travel to one of our centres, you know, one of the centres that are, are running the assessment in England and Wales. Yeah, and I think there's, I think there's three, yeah, three, 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 yeah. three centres, aren't there? And I suppose a final um, thing just to bear in mind for those um sort of have trained over broad if you're a qualified um lawyer from overseas have a look at our um, webinar on the uh, 
what the situation is for qualified lawyers because it's a bit a bit different there in terms of um what what you need in terms of qualifying work experience or what you don't need and so have a look at that if specifically you have qualified as a lawyer overseas um i think that brings us um to the end of our questions well done richard on answering so many of those and thank you to everyone who submitted questions hopefully we got through um a lot of them i know we haven't been able to get through all of them we will be running future webinars. We're going to be doing a candidate focus one, which is likely going to run on the 15th of March. So put that um, in your diary. There is a link below which um, you can click on to offer feedback. It'll only take two minutes, but it's really helpful for us to understand whether um, this webinar worked well for you, whether it covered the types of things you'd like to cover or whether it's whether you'd find something else um, more useful um, to cover and we can then consider um, improving our webinars or covering different subjects in the future. Um, but hopefully you have found it useful. A big thanks and shout out to Matt as ever for the brilliant um, production job he's done behind the, the scenes. Um, but otherwise, just wanted to thank everybody for joining us and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the afternoon. <laughs>